part. Okay, good evening, colleagues, and welcome to the 31st edition of the Tourism Online Forum series in March 2024. And tonight, we are delighted to have you joining us, which is uh, this seminar hosted by the Center for Advanced Tourism Research CATS at the Hokkaido University. This is your host, Mo. And for tonight, it is indeed an honor to have Dr. Mausha uh, Rossifan to share her recent research about digital transformation of tourism and related community impact. So Marcia uh, Rossifan is a postdoctoral researcher in the Cultural Geographic Group at Wageningen University and a research in the Netherlands. And she holds a PhD in sustainable urban and regional development from the University of Greece in Australia. Uh, in Austria, sorry. Her research has examined digital transformations within the realm of tourism, urban space, and geographic education. Since 2014, she has engaged in a long-term ethnography project on Airbnb and its transformation of the home, everyday life, and the gen uh, gendered, racialized, and classed divisions of household labor. And more recently, she has more uh, she has made a contribution to debate in the geographic education on the use of digital technologies in learning and teaching. And she is also an associate editor of the Journal of Tourism Geographies and has recently published a monograph on hospitality, home, and life in the uh, platform economies of tourism with uh, uh, Pargrave um, Macmillan. So today, uh, tonight, her uh, keywords is digital technology, digitalization, tourism communities, and sustainable innovations and equitable tourism. Uh, since uh, we are living in the very digital uh, age, and I think this type of topic is extremely useful for younger generation of tourism researchers and our students. So please note that this online lecture will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel of the Center uh, for Advanced Tourism Research. So now let's invite Mausha to share her lecture Please leave your comments and questions below in the Q&A box. We also offer uh, the subtitle generating service. Please click on the subtitle function if you want to see it. So now the floor is yours. Wonderful. Uh, thanks so much for uh, this introduction, Professor, Professor uh, Chu Mong, and uh, also many thanks to the Center for Advanced uh, Tourism Studies and Hokkaido University for inviting me here. Um, this is, I'm working with two laptops. One laptop is with my camera and the other one is with my notes. So I'm addressing you now straightforward, but I'm moving to the other screen to make sure that I um, stay within the structure of my presentation. I'm not very good at that if I don't have notes, so I'll be um, focusing on there. Uh, but many thanks. Um, my name is Marietje Rolofsen, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher uh, in the Cultural Geography Group in uh, Wageningen University and Research, which is in the Netherlands. Uh, before I delve into my seminar today on digital transformations of tourism, um, I'd like to uh, briefly um, share something about my background. Um, uh, Professor Chu Mong has already said a few things, but just to contextualize this presentation, why am I focusing on specific topics? Uh, and I'll then give a sort of outline of my seminar. Uh, so in the past 10 years or so, I've uh, studied the social and uh, geographical um, impacts of digital technologies uh, and digital platforms in relation to tourism mostly. Uh, I've focused uh, in the last, um, let's say 10 years or so, uh, since my PhD actually on Airbnb. Uh, which uh, some of you may know, it's a digital platform that allows uh, people to book residential accommodation or uh, rooms in residential accommodation, uh, often for touristic purposes, not solely, but mostly for touristic purposes. Um, and when I started to research this platform initially in 2014, my interest went out to the, uh, let's say, the lived realities of people who actually engage in this economy. Uh, I wanted to know more about 
um, how people's everyday lives uh, became part of this global economy and how their homes and their lives were drawn into processes, digital processes of valuation uh, and commodification. So how their homes and everyday lives became commercialized. So um, let me click. Yes, there we go. It works. I'm happy that the technology works. <laughs> I was also interested to know what these impacts uh, of Airbnb were on the lives of people living in cities. So also those who were not necessarily engaged in these economies. So neighborhoods and other urban residents and how these platforms shape their understanding of home and of hospitality. And some of my findings um, I will present today in this seminar. Um, they are the result of several uh, related projects that I've carried out on Airbnb. Uh, it's also been evidenced in the book that uh, Professor Chu Meng just mentioned, hospitality, home and life in the platform economies of tourism. Uh, so that kind of bundles all of my work on this platform. I've done many other things. I'm currently very interested in uh, other aspects of tourism, like tourism and hospitality work, uh, the gendered and racialized divisions of tourism work, and also uh, the stigma that is often tied to this kind of work. But today, that's uh, that's I won't be speaking about that. Um, I have some automated lights in the room that only respond to my movement. Here we go. So I turn it on again. This is another uh, technology of which we can question its utility, actually. Uh, let's move on to the outline of the seminar. So the seminar that I'm giving uh, today is uh, structured as followed. Um, first, I want to provide some contextualization. So uh, what what is the digital really? So how can we understand it as a concept, but also what is the history of the digital in relation to tourism? Then I will, in the, the second part of the lecture, I'll talk about uh, some of the developments and impacts that digital technologies have had on different scales. So on the scale, global scale, but also more local scale, on the scale of the community. I've been asked to talk about community communities today. I'll give some examples of Airbnb, but also other digital technologies and apps, um, websites, and so forth. And I intend to finalize the seminar with some considerations for uh, what I call sustainable digital futures in tourism, if there's such a thing. Um, I want to always do some referencing work um, in my um, writing, but also in my lectures, I take inspiration from scholars that work across uh, different fields and in different disciplines, mostly geography. I'm working in geography departments uh, these are some of the key readings that actually underpin this lecture, uh, mostly the book on the right, but also the one in the middle. Um, so these are important uh, books for me, and I just want to acknowledge them in, in my writing. So um, let's start with some conceptual grounding. The term uh, digital is very loosely used in public discourse. Um, we kind of think that we know what we're talking about when we talk about the digital. Um, but in reality, the digital has a very wide variety of meanings. Also in, in the different uh, academic fields that we work in. Um, and also um, how we define the digital really depends on the kind of context within which the digital is embedded. Um, so um, discussing it within a specific context, as, as I will try to do also during this lecture, is, is really allowing us also to see the kind of sustainability impact that the digital technologies may have. So let me give some examples of how the digital has been defined. Uh, generally speaking, the digital exists as a real material uh, object. Uh, we can touch it, we can feel it, we can hear it, or we can sense it in some other ways. Uh, and we refer to that as on text. Um, digital devices, they can bring forth certain phenomena and some human practices. Uh, and to give the example of this lecture, we are currently connecting uh, with the use of computers, in my case, a laptop, but also communication software like Zoom, which is um, 
relying on codes and coding programs. Um, and it's likely that this um, seminar will be recorded and stored in forms of data in uh, data centers. Uh, a data center is uh, on the background of this image of the slide. That's, um, that's where those, those things are usually stored. Um, so um, the hardware and the software that operate together, uh, so hardware computers, software coding programs, uh, that is uh, kind of what we mean by the materiality of the digital um, that brings all of these kind of practices and things that we do into being. Uh, now, of course, all of these materialities uh, that make up computers, but also programs and the storing devices, they are all sourced and made in different places. So there's actually a real geography to the material that makes up the digital. So digital devices are manufactured from materials such as metals, uh, glass, and plastics. Uh, they are mined in different places and also recycled in different places, and very often in places that are very far away from where we use them. Um, mobile phones, for example, they contain certain minerals uh, that are bought in uh, in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the mining of these resources actually um, is not uh, completely without issues or problems. And they often also lead to internal conflict in countries. So um, then digital devices are powered through electricity. Uh, these are, uh, electricity is uh, often produced in uh, what, we call coal-fired fire, coal fired, uh, power plants. Uh, and also our data, as I mentioned, is often stored in data centers, in clouds. Um, the cloud um, Dropbox is an example. We also have OneDrive. We have many different um, uh, clouds nowadays that we rely on for work and also in tourism. Uh, and these data centers also rely on water supplies to cool these machineries, which, which become very hot. Um, and of course, last but not least, there is e-waste. So all of these digital devices that kind of have outrun their um, uh, lifetime uh, that end up to be discarded. Um, so they're usually disposed of or stripped off their components. And then sometimes they're recycled um, under sometimes very dangerous conditions in places that are actually far away from where the digital is used. So I'm already trying to um, mention some of the sustainability aspects of the material of the digital. So we have to look at where it comes from. Um, so indeed, all of these materials that I've just mentioned, hardware, software, uh, and the connections between them, they rely on infrastructure. Um, they also require a constant supply of energy uh, and these connections, uh, global networks of computer connections, they require uh, fiber optic highways, for example, that, um, that are um, underneath uh, the oceans. Uh, here is a map of this kind of infrastructure that you see. So you can see where the submarine cable map maps are actually uh, located around the globe. Uh, now, of course, all of these infrastructures are embedded in places, and they really have the capacity to affect uh, the specific environments and the communities in which they become embedded. So um, that is another sustainability aspect that we can have a look at. <laughs> so I've now described the digital as uh, material. There's also other ways to look at, look at digital uh, technologies. Um, the digital has been referred to as a form of logics. Uh, so through interaction with users, digital technologies and devices really have the capacity to mediate travelers' interactions with certain environments, but also their perceptions of the environment and the world around them. Uh, so we continuously interact with digital technologies to travel from one place to the next. Um, and we also produce data in the process of doing so. And I've given here the example of the digital entry ports at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. So we need coding and codes to actually enter certain spaces to progress to the next step. Uh, now, examples of... Um, 
digital the digital as a form of logics are really endless when it comes to tourism um and i think the, the aviation sector is one of them which is um, become really quite evident so all kinds of aspects of aviation nowadays are digitized they rely very heavily on digital infrastructures um, think about booking an, a flight or receiving uh, tickets through your apps or software uh, check-in procedures are now entirely um, digitized at airports not all of them obviously but some um, Cockpits uh, in airplanes operate on digital coding. Uh, flight attendants nowadays work very uh, intensively with digital devices to carry out their work. So this is just one aspect or one domain of tourism that is in entirely digitized, in fact. So uh, hopefully that gives some kind of example of how we can view the digital as logics. Uh, we can also view the digital as a form of aesthetics. Uh, so digital technologies have the capacity to shape how uh, uh, destinations, but also cultures and people are experienced and understood, and also how they are valued. So when uh, software and code become embedded in these places, in destinations, uh, they actually really have the potential to shape the kind of nature of that place. So they become augmented, they become digitally augmented environments. And I will try to explain that with the next example. Uh, because in fact, many tourist destinations and popular attractions now are um, what we call layered through diff different levels of um, digital uh, content. Um, so um, think, for example, about museum visits that are uh, moderated through audio guides um, that you can access digitally on your phone. So they really describe and narrate where you're going, what you're seeing, so they can really play an important de determining role in how you understand those uh, uh, environments, but also navigating a city through an app on your phone. Um, th these are all kinds of um, digital um, intermediaries that uh, shape how you see a city or a destination. Um, but also tourists have been afforded more central roles to augment and circulate versions of destinations, um, mostly through uh, digital phones uh, and the related software. So they are, um, for, for example, social media have also play, played a tremendous role in how uh, certain tourist destinations are um, presented, uh, aestheticized, let's say. Um, but um, um, other examples are um, quick response codes, uh, facilitating payment, um, Wi-Fi, um, these, these kind of digital um, um, layers can be found um, frequently uh, in, in the, the destinations that we visit. This is just an example of uh, Park Güell in, in Barcelona in Spain. Uh, before one enters the park, you can scan the QR code, which prov provides you with a kind of map of how you can navigate the space, but also how you can access public Wi-Fi, for example. So, um, this kind of digital content or layering in destinations really changes the nature of those spaces and places, how we can access and use them. Uh, but we also um, are affected by digital technologies and how they shape the sociality of a place. So how we communicate with others um, and, um, and how we communicate within that space. Um, Many digital media in tourism that we use um, are actually um, made with a very spatial orientation, which means um, that they are really heavily drawing on geographical content, but also the users of these applications and digital uh, devices actually produce geographical content. Um, this is to say, um, I'll just give you an example, for example, Foursquare, uh, which has for a very long time been a, an important app in tourism. It operates on smartphones and other digital devices. 
and it allows users to actually check in to certain destinations and then they share their geolocation with other users on the app. So they can be alerted if other users are in there, um, are close by or not. Um, but at the same time, these apps really mediate um, how tourists navigate certain spaces, where they go to, where they eat, uh, the sites that they visit, um, important attractions. Um, and, and in doing so, they actually make certain spaces available to tourists that were previously unknown to them or inaccessible. However, we need to make a little note there. And since this lecture is about sustainability impact, um, how can we think of these apps in different uh, ways uh, that maybe perpetrate sustainability issues? How these spaces are made visible, whether we're talking about a tourist attraction or a restaurant, um, and how they're made visible through these apps is um, quite political. So there is a, a power dynamic there that we have to look like look at. And that's perhaps most clearly evidenced in the search results that we receive through apps like TripAdvisor or Google Search, right, or booking.com. These are quite big apps um, here in Europe. Um, very often we are presented with results that somehow already have obtained their status for reasons they've been booked very often, they've been rated very highly. Um, so they really represent and confirm certain existing ideas and values that we have about those places, right? So search results in apps can be determined by commercial values. Um, and um, they're sometimes also sponsored. So what we get represent presented with in these apps and, um, and websites is often determined by specific ideas about what is a nice place to visit and whatnot. And this um, maybe not deliberately sometimes leaves out search results that can equally be of value. Um, so what we see and what we don't see is a very um, um, big question in terms of uh, sustainability. Who has the power to shape where we go and where we don't go? I hope this becomes clearer throughout the, the next few slides. Um, another way of looking at the digital is as discourse. So um, discourse, by discourse, I mean a term or a, um, a concept that is very easily used, uh, but also very vaguely used. So something that has become accepted over time. We, we take for granted that we know what the digital means. Uh, but in fact, the digital, as I've just mentioned, can be uh, meaning quite different things in different settings. In the tourism industry, the digital and digitalization is often used um, at the same time with the word innovation or progress, right? So we get this understanding of the digital as if it is something um, we need to engage in, to strive forward. It's seen as something positive. By doing so, this label sometimes often obscures or makes invisible um, things um, that actually can also be revealed. Um, so the materialities that, that I've just mentioned, where digital technologies are sourced, but also the kind of processes, also social practices that are brought into being, and sometimes the unwanted effects of such processes. Um, I'm thinking about e-waste, but I'll also mention another few examples in the following slides. So these are just a few ways of thinking about the digital, um, just trying to, to make more concrete about what it really is when we talk about the digital in tourism. It would be very tempting to read the digital as some kind of contemporary phenomena, something that we've just only recently seen. Uh, in the case of tourism, this is actually not the case. Um, the tourism industry has been very long considered as uh, one of the first industries to engage with digital technologies. It has adopted computerized systems for centuries um, to automate transactions, for example, but also to accelerate certain work processes. 
Um, the industry has really used digital technologies for many decades to scale and accelerate certain economic transactions. So when we look at the history of the digital in tourism, we often start in the late 1950s and 1960s with the invention and the implementation of what is called the computer reservation system, the CRS, which started in the aviation industry. Um, and this invention of the computer reservation system, uh, we can see it in this image here, uh, was really celebrated as one of the key moments in the history of tourism and the travel industry, uh, which came together with another invention that was seen as very important, namely uh, the, the arrival of commercial jet airplanes. That was also around the 1950s. So these two developments or innovations came together. Together, they've also led to the um, expansion of tourism, I would say the phenomenal expansion of tourism and tourism mobility. Before this, updating um, inventories and processing passenger data was something very laborious and time consuming, was mostly done by hand on paper recording cards um, and, and information was communicated uh, through telephone or telexes. So this preceded actually the invention of the computer reservations uh, system. So to distribute and, and to make airline information quicker and better accessible, uh, the objective was just to create this computer reservation system that could execute and um, process information automatically. Um, and again, this development went hand in hand with the uh, invention of the, the commercial jet airlines after the Second World War. So these two developments were really successfully marketed and advertised um, to the predominantly Euro-American public um, as the ideal of a modern society of modernity. Of, um, of It was a very techno-utopian fantasy that was communicated through these two inventions. And between the 1950s and 1970s, there was an average increase of global air traffic of around 10% per year. Uh, so this invention of the computer reservation system was very crucial to ensure that this um, massive expansion of mobility could somehow be organized. Now, beyond the operation by airlines themselves, this computer reservation system was then launched to travel agencies. And this has had a tremendous impact uh, uh, on, on the organization of travel. Today, 60 years later, this computer reservation is commonly termed the global distribution channel. And it um, is used to store and distribute information about tourist project products uh, beyond airlines. So we can use the global distribution channels today um, the system today to uh, book hotel rooms, um, rental cars, package tours, and a whole range of other um, tourist-related products, if you will. So this, let's say, framework of the computer reservation system now underpins websites such as Expedia.com, Booking.com, and many other apps. Uh, also, Airbnb uses a similar system. And uh, many algorithms underpin these kinds of systems, uh, which allow these systems to make uh, decisions without human interference. Uh, so they've also become granted with a significant power to uh, affect how we travel, where we travel, and the prices that we pay. Uh, so they have been a tremendous invention uh, that reconfigured tourism and global mobility. We still use them today, and uh, it's just a few images on the slide that show you what it looks like now. So without going into too much detail, I'll the highlight a couple of other developments in, in tourism that, that have been crucial, like developments globally in information and com communication technology, not just for tourism, but that have definitely had effects for tourism and the tourism industries. Um, this was roughly throughout the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, firstly, the introduction of the personal computer. Uh, so the, the launch of the desktop computer uh, introduced in the 1982. 
um, this allowed uh, for a large section of the global population, uh, certainly very selective part of the global population, but um, it tra really transformed the personal lives of, of individuals um, and that did not work with computers um, for for their um, for their work. Uh, it allowed them to work from a computer at home. <laughs> Although travel agents started to work with computers such as the computer reservation system from as early as 1976, these computers, the personal computer, became more widespread also in other commercial enterprises, um, uh, but mostly during the 1980s. Another important development was the modern internet or commercial internet in the 1990s, and these really ensured that computers across the globe became linked to each other. Uh, that allowed for people to transport content from one computer to another. Seem very basic infrastructures, but we use them today as if uh, as if we, we usually don't think about them. But these have been major developments, obviously, also for tourism. Uh, finally, also the World Wide Web, uh, which actually was software that allowed people to access content that was provided by others on web pages uh, or to contribute their own content. Uh, these developments have really changed how societies communicated with each other, learned about each other, or learned earned a living also within tourism. And they've afforded many tourism businesses, small and big, to profile themselves online through websites. Now, for the sake of keeping time, I will spare you many other developments that we use commonly today, because I don't, I don't have all the time in the world. I see I'm already on half an hour. I try to skip through the next few ones. Uh, so I'll spare you developments such as Web 2.0 and Web, uh, Web 1.0. Um, other important developments have obviously been mobile internet. Uh, this was really a shift in the landscape of digital technologies because people could access the internet from anywhere they wanted. Uh, this also affected how people traveled. It afforded people to stay connected when they moved away from home to go and travel uh, and it also understand, uh, transformed um, significantly how we understand the idea of being away uh, on, uh, while we're traveling. So beyond contributing to economic growth, I've, as I've just mentioned, uh, digital technologies also have had the potential to really shape social worlds, change social practices of people who were on holidays, uh, but also other aspects of, of social life. life. In fact, if we cite um, um, our fellow tourism scholars, Anna Maria Munar and Sylvia Diamanti, digital technologies have really afforded tourists and also other travelers uh, uh, possibilities and also resistances. So um, digital technologies are not uh, passive objects, but they really shape behavior. They shape how people act. Uh, people can interact with others far, far away. They can engage in transactions and engage in social media, for example, while they are on the road. So if we look at digital technologies in that way, um, we can also argue that they have the power to transform how we act socially as tourists and travelers and how we move around and understand the world around us. Now, so far, these are some of the positive effects. And I will try to wrap up my... Uh, lecture within the next 10 minutes. Um, I hope I can manage that. There are um, some aspects of digital technologies uh, that raise uh, questions about equity and also how digital technologies can contribute to sustainability issues. Uh, I will now summarize some of the most popular debates. I don't have enough time to, to expand on many of them. I've just selected a few for you. Um, but I've also, I'll also leave you at the end with a slide that maybe gives you some inspiration to, to look at these um, sustainability aspects yourself. Uh, so one of the major debates currently in tourism, but also in other domains, is the digital divide. Um, and this refers to the uneven spread of information and communication technologies, also digital technologies across countries, but also within societies. And very, the core dimensions of the digital divide are affordability and accessibility of digital technologies. 
uh, but also uh, affordability and accessibility of the internet and in general how uh, skilled people are in using digital technologies. The internet has certainly become widespread uh, for many, but not all countries have been able to connect as much as others. Uh, and I think one of the previous seminars in the in the COTS um, seminar series was given by Pro Professor Joseph Cheer, who pre-recorded uh, his seminar um, because he was affected by um, an unstable interconnect internet connection. Uh, and, and this is actually quite common. If we look at inequalities of access uh, to the internet, for, for example, they usually align uh, with uh, higher and lower levels of income in certain countries. So in general, generally speaking, income poor and less populated areas around the globe tend to be underserved, which is to say they have a lesser availability and um, a low affordability of, um, of, of internet technologies and digital technologies. These inc include uh, small islands developing states um, for whom tourism remains a major source of income and uh, which are often very reliant on tourism uh, for income. Um, then there's difference between uh, regions as well. So it's not just the difference between countries um, in the European Union, for example, Nordic countries score very high in terms of accessibility and affordability of digital technologies compared to Southern European and Eastern European countries. But even within countries, uh, there are some disparities. There are some uh, differences between uh, people's skills of using these technologies. Um, so even if the infrastructure for digital technologies expand and improve other factors such as um, people's gender or age, class or ethnicity can really determine uh, their skills and their access to these sources. And they are summarized in here, that should have been my slide. So um, yes, there are, there are certain digital skills and awareness issues tied to digital technologies. And, and all this goes to show that the advantages that we think we can derive from digital technologies and their potential to promote more sustainable forms of tourism and hospitalities are actually not evenly distributed. So there is a division left. These divides also apply to providers of tourism and particular to small and medium tourism enterprises in uh, smaller communities, which regularly lack the resources, but also the skills to operate these digital technologies. I've listed a whole number of issues here, but I, I won't go through them very long. So there's also a lack of finances uh, to invest in new technologies, but also a lack of time to invest in certain skills to understand new software and oftentimes small and medium enterprises in um, smaller tourism destinations, um, they have to face competition with very large and powerful intermediaries. I'm thinking, uh, for example, a platform like booking.com, some destinations, some accommodation providers have very serious issues being featured on these platforms, right? So there are some real challenges here uh, to who dominates the digital space over others. Uh, these are sustainability um, uh, questions. So, uh, so far I've commented on how even uneven access to digital technologies uh, is a sustainability issue, but what I would like to do now is to give a few examples of how digital technologies can affect local communities directly. Uh, also, uh, people's everyday lives in ways that are seen as, as unsustainable. I will start with the example of Airbnb. Um, I've studied this platform for some time now. Um, so the idea by, behind these platforms, as I mentioned, is that people uh, can book residential ac accommodation or rooms within accommodation um, in residential accommodation. Uh, and the purpose of this, at least that's what the platforms uh, say in their advertisement, is that tourists can supposedly have a more uh, real or authentic understanding of local lives by living in this home and being in neighborhoods that are not necessarily uh, advertised usually by uh, uh, tourism agencies. 
So they will live in neighborhoods that are usually not meant for tourism and uh, they live close to residents or with residents even and um, are surrounded by, by local uh, shops that they usually don't see. Now, um, these all sound like good intentions and I'm sure they are, but there have also been controversies and negative externalities produced by platforms like Airbnb. In fact, they've played a major role in extracting residential accommodation from local long-term rental markets. Um, this has especially affected uh, people who actually live in these communities, in cities and, and villages, where uh, tourists uh, come very frequently in places like Barcelona and Amsterdam. This has been a real problem uh, because housing markets were already um, quite faced with challenges with inavailability and affordability of housing um, but there's also been other issues related to apps like airbnb like platforms like airbnb um, here i'm just uh, uh, iterating what's on the slide frequently residents are confronted with antisocial behavior on part of tourists who come into their uh, residential area in their neighborhoods uh, as such, it has a real impact on the local environment. Um, there's also been an impact on the tourism industry for long hotels and other formal forms of accommodation have argued that platforms like Airbnb form uh, uh, an unfair competition because they don't have to uh, adhere to the rules that hotels and uh, usually have to abide to in terms of health and safety infrastructure. Um, but um, the impacts have actually also been very different depending on the neighborhoods within which these Airbnbs have been listed, uh, but also the local, local housing market context. Um, good, let's, let's move on to the next example because I'm running uh, short on time. Um, I'll just um, skip through the next one. So certain apps are often uh, that are not necessarily for tourism are sometimes used for touristic purposes. An example uh, of which is Tinder, which is a major dating app uh, globally. Uh, it's been appropriated for things like sex tourism, frequently positioning women using uh, the apps as commodities that are uh, supposedly to be consumed by male tourists from powerful and wealthy countries. Um, and in this way, they reproduce uh, existing colonial and heteropatriarchal pra practices. Um, but there's also uh, instances uh, where um, apps or websites are used for things that um, they are not intended to. And in this case, um, for example, Google Street View, a function that is still incorporated in Google, Google um, it has allowed tourists, digital tourists, so to say, to um, to access certain sites that have actually been banned in real life. So this is an example of uh, Uluru, which is a famous uh, site for tourism, or this it used to be in, in Australia. Uh, long after this site was actually banned from climbing physically by tourists, uh, Google uh, street maps still allow people to access the site digitally, so to climb this um, site through Google. And the traditional owners of Uluru actually made a case to Google and said that they did not wish to have this and they were successful. They've managed to successfully take down this digitized site of Uluru and people can no longer access it online as such. In some instances, solutions to issues provoked by digital technologies have been um, have resulted in new developments, in new uh, digital technological uh, developments that a, that really aim to overcome these issues that I've just mentioned. So, in response to Airbnb, for example, uh, Airbnb is another platform aims to provide a more sustainable alternative. And they do that by using cooperative business models. Uh, but there are also other apps like Inclusive, Must b, &B or Mr. b, &B which try to challenge discrimination flap, uh, uh, practices that go on on platforms like Airbnb. So they, do, they, they adopt different strategies to actually do this by uh, anonymizing host and guest profiles, 
uh, until the booking process is complete. Uh, these are fortunately inclusive must be and be and Mr. B and B. I'm not sure. Maybe the latter still still exists, but some have been taken over by um, by other platforms themselves. So there are many business in excuse me initiatives currently that aim to shape more uh, sustainable digital tourism futures. There are platforms that really nudge tourists and travelers to take more ethical and responsible forms of behaviors. Uh, I mentioned Airbnb, they apply non-extractive or cooperative business models that really counter uh, traditional business models, uh, for-profit models like those on, on Airbnb, for example. Uh, they do this uh, in other ways. Um, in, in some instances, they make sure that profits are kept at the source in communities. They are reinvested in social projects in local communities. In some instances, um, users of the platform have a bigger say in how uh, the platform or app is developed. Um, there are platforms and digital technologies that place a high emphasis in transparency. So how is their data used? Do they comply with local regulations? Um, and so on and so forth. Um, I'll just skip through this slide for the sake of time. Then there are um, businesses that have actually um, um, turned this this kind of digital turn into a new business development in new business model. So if we look at um, um, a digital detox holidays or digital free holidays, they really try to find solutions to the anxiety and addiction that has arisen because of the use of digital technologies in in modern society. So um, there they give the opportunity to travel for the purpose of getting rid of these anxieties by offering environments where there are no digital technologies at all, no network, no internet, no nothing. So there have been very different um, responses. Now let's finish the seminar with focusing on uh, developing more uh, sustainable digital tourism futures. So how can digital technologies be used to ensure more sustainable, socially just and equitable uh, tourism futures? Um, and what are um, uh, the broader implications of digital technologies for aspects of social, environmental and economic sustainability in tourism as seen from both the supply and demand side, so consumers and producers? I uh, rely here mostly on the work of Stefan Gosling. I will provide you with references in the end. Now, of course, there have been uh, some, some digital technologies and apps that provide information and nudge tourists and travelers and businesses towards more ethical and sustainable forms of consumption and behavior. Um, I'm thinking here of, uh, of, of apps that provide you with uh, low carbon initiatives, uh, uh, sorry, low carbon um, uh, alternatives. So there are apps by which you can see how much um, CO2 is uh, entailed in, uh, produced in, during your travels and you can choose to, to use different options. Um, there are other smart technologies that measure what you do as a consumer and how you could potentially more efficiently uh, use energy or, or other forms. Um, uh, or other other things that actually produce more sustainable outcomes. Um, there have been te technologies incorporated in tourism and travel infrastructure that mitigate, reduce, or prevent unsustainable outcomes. And this is also related to the example that I just mentioned on CO2. Um, but then there are also technologies, technologies that aim to change the nature and outcome of tourism in and of itself through new tourism products. And I've just mentioned these um, uh, these um, uh, apps like Airbnb, but also new forms of travel, such as digital detox travel that are completely rethinking the nature of what tourism and travel should be. Um, some concluding thoughts, because I'm really at the end of uh, my lecture here. Um, really, there remain some very critical aspects um, to be looked at when we talk about the digital turn in tourism. And I think tourism scholars really have a role to play in that. 
there are some key questions that we can ask us uh, beyond thinking about solutions that I've just shown you many, many um, examples of, uh, because these solutions that I've just shown you are just a very instrumental view of technology as a tool that serves tourism business mostly. Uh, but they don't really challenge structural issues that are currently prevalent in tourism. So I've mentioned a few questions here uh, that actually think beyond digital technologies as, as solutions. In general, when we think of new digital innovations, um, one of the questions we could ask is, is who is developing the technology and for whom and what purpose? That is a key question, obviously. But what results from that question, I would say, is what is there a potential impact on the environment, society, and economic, economy? Um, now, that is a difficult one. Obviously, some uh, innovations are there for a different purpose uh, than uh, they have unintended effects. So uh, in the case of Airbnb, the commercials will suggest that tourists will have a very local authentic experience of people's residential homes. But one of the unintended consequences is that they tend to take residential housing away from um, long-term rental housing markets. So we need to think really carefully before we design anything new or come up with new solutions about what the potential environmental, economic, and social consequences could be. If they might be there, these consequences, should these technologies be developed at all? Or should we say, well, there is no app for that, perhaps we should not design it. We can also consider what data are generated, um, by who, and how will those data be used? Um, I haven't really touched upon this topic during the lecture, but uh, there is a big literature um, in academia, but also in uh, public domain on how our data is inappropriately used um, uh, to achieve certain um, mostly commercial outcomes. So in relation to that, also who profits from technologies and who does not, and what are the consequences of those profits, um, and who holds sovereignty and ownership rights uh, of these digital technologies, but also the data. Um, so what is at stake um, and what are the, the results of such applications? So these are uh, some of the questions. Um, I've also presented here some, some things to keep in mind. I think overall, um, if we want to really achieve a sustainable digital tourism future, these digital developments should be led by the interests and the needs of those who are directly concerned uh, with its application. So a more bottom-up approach to design, perhaps. Um, and with this slide, I'd like to conclude the seminar. Okay, thank you very much for the lecture. It's, uh, it's definitely mind-blowing for me, uh, especially the digital using right i think it's related to everybody right now after your lecture i feel like nowadays we are traveling definitely everything connect with the digital and ict tech uh, uh, technology so i would like to encourage our audience to ask questions we have a quite some people so you can either raise up your hand or put in a currently box okay we have one from philip Thank you for the lecture. Two questions. Why is the DCAT long back in 1979 established that tourism has more social and cultural impact, especially in the developing countries? Now tourism's impact on the environment and biodiversity is even more growing and threatening. How would you look at the power of digital technology to reduce this impact and minimize the trade-offs? So maybe you want to go one by one wow this is a yeah i'm reading the questions also in my screen this is a this is a long question and um yeah so uh, trickling down um because uh, i also see in the next question is about differences in relation to the global north and global yeah. south 
Um, I would like to think of that as the majority and minority world. Um, surely many of these major apps, um, which are referred to as platform capitalism that have been based on very extractive ideas and for-profit orientations, have been developed in countries um, like the US, uh, Europe, um, um, so and and they have kind of um, um, in a way taken uh, uh, control of specific markets in in um, across the globe. Um, now tourism in, uh, I'm just reiterating the question now tourism impacts on environment and biodiversity is even more glaring and threatening. How would you look at the power of digital technology technology to reduce these impacts and minimize trade-offs? Um, I think one of the things uh, that we need to talk about is growth in this sense. So many of these platforms at the very source of their existence, at the very beginning of the history of digital technologies, had this aim to skill production, right? They um, wanted to ensure that bookings of flights, for example, uh, would be easier, but also quicker, and thus that uh, we could accelerate kind of the sales of these products. Um, I think that pro-growth uh, idea that has really shaped the tourism industry is mirrored in many of these apps and digital technologies that we see today. So they are about ease of booking, um, more frequent travel perhaps, um, and getting into places that are perhaps not um, particularly equipped uh, for tourism to take place, including very fragile environments, uh, but also in places where there are um, housing markets that are currently under a lot of stress. Um, I would think it's a, an interesting turn to think about degrowth in digital technologies. Uh, to consider, um, yes, also more sustainable alternatives in terms of their materialities. Um, I've shown you a few slides on where the materialities of the digital are sourced. Um, we also see there an expansion, expansion of infrastructure, an expansion of data centers. I think the debate in tourism needs to be around, is that data necessary? Do we need more data? Do we need more apps? Do we need more infrastructure? Uh, so uh, the, I think there are definitely the current trend in tourism studies to think about degrowth also applies to digital technologies in tourism. Long answer for a very challenging question. Okay. Thank you. We have another question from Zhao. And thank you for the uh, for, uh, for your talk. I want to ask about the type of event like uh, rural art and the proportion of digital content is sustainable for the event. Mm. Is that any way to determine it? Thank you. That's a yeah. difficult one. <laughs> but you yeah. study rural tourism, right? Uh, I've studied mostly urban tourism. Uh, urban that, tourism. That, that's that's fine. Um, mm. How to select uh, digital content? I'm just wondering, um, is this for the promotion of an event as such? Or are, are they t thinking about um, providing a digital, digitized version of a rural arts festival? Um, so I'm, mm. I'm unsure about how this. Question... I think I think maybe you can try to answer from both sides the the promotion side also the the visitor sharing side as perspective because nowadays people travel based on other people's feedback. I think. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. This is um um uh okay. So um, that is really difficult to answer that question. I I'm just thinking. Um, yeah, it, it, what gets shared nowadays is, is um, uh, as I mentioned, it's also very prone to uh, the kind of algorithms that underpin certain technologies. So if we want to shine light on rural arts festivals, of course, they, uh, they are really determined by the engagement of, of consumers with that kind of content that gets distributed on apps. Um, 
Yeah, that's a difficult question. I can also say sometimes that I don't have an answer to that, right? <laughs> right, yes. Okay, can okay. I have a question before the next one come up? Yeah. Uh, is there any regulation about this? Because recently I also listen to other type of podcasts. Nowadays, we are not just engaging one specific app as a tool because it's a whole entire team span a year invented it to engage with your user experiences. So it's they are professional. Some some of them even contains AI. So they're definitely not using a tool. It's a kind of a, a very powerful thing. You can't define it. So I'm wondering, since this digital platform are quite different among each region, is there any regulation to control it? Or there is no such kind of thing so far? Yes, absolutely. There is um, a lot of re regulation. Um, apps and uh, websites are no longer on control. There, it obviously depends on which country and which region you live in. In the EU, we have um, um, uh, uh, different types of uh, EU level regulations, but also country wide regulations as to mm. The kind of data that can be used by these platforms or apps or websites, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. um, so um, a consensus, a consent is needed on part of the the consumers, and it's no longer um, possible to just gather all the data you want from your uh, users uh, with, with so without their consent. But there are also rules pertaining to what can and cannot be asked. Um, Airbnb, for example, has been uh, regulated differently across cities, but also across countries. Airbnb can and no longer advertise uh, homes on its platform in certain cities, in certain uh, villages, even uh, because they have had such a major impact on housing. So there is... Um, there is active regulation on part of different applications on the use of data more broadly, uh, definitely. So that there, uh, that is definitely a, a question of uh, politics and the kind of values that are attached to uh, uh, to society and what is considered to be um, uh, 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 so, uh, so for example, in in the in the Netherlands, uh, increasingly housing is seen as as a right that needs to be um, reserved for residents, and so um, the, the needs of tourists in that sense get get a different position within the political debate. Mm. Okay, I also have uh, another follow up question. Since in Japan, you know, uh, Booking dot com is popular, but only among the foreigners. The Japanese, they are using very different app, like a Rakuten or also Garen and also kind of platform. But uh, they are not even available in English. So foreign tourists will definitely consider that. But I observe some of the hotels are much cheaper with more discount for domestic tourists. So that also makes me thinking the definitely building a very different ecosystem and a culture among different type of tourists. So you see everybody carry a phone, but they actually, based on what kind of app and what kind of platform they use, they are quite different culture, not just by, by their nationality, right? So what, what do you think about the future trend of this kind of thing? Yeah. Well, yeah. surely, um... Automated translation has changed a lot, but mm. then uh, there remains a local reg like regulation in place. Some platforms are not allowed to operate in certain contexts. Uh, certain websites are barred in certain countries. And I think it's very uh, relevant that you point that out. I've given many examples in this talk that are um, uh, relevant within the European and the North American context. Um, and I should definitely look at um, locally more relevant uh, applications and apps. Mm. Um, this certainly has to do also with hegemonies. Uh, so um, the perceived uh, dominance of certain languages, uh, English is definitely one of them. So in Google search results, for example, you may still find a dominance of English language results. 
in your search queries. Um, yeah, um, language is an important issue. And I think it's also interesting to look at some of the um, developments within local contexts um, that also have the opportunity to challenge some of the uh, culturally dominant ideas of tourism and hospitality. So for example, the Airbnb platform has really been developed from a very North American understanding of hospitality, which is evident in the way in which they review and rate, but also in how they present content on their website. There's a real um, I, a specific idea about what hospitality should be and should look like. And sometimes they forego on thinking that certain cultural traditions in certain places have shaped hospitality very differently. So how we think of hospitality in Japan or even Hokkaido might be different from here in Magninga in the Netherlands. And these kind of hegemonies are kind of um, recreated through these platforms. And I think therefore local, um, local initiatives and local alternatives are very interesting to look at, also from a tourist perspective, so to say. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's wait if there is other questions from our audience. See, our audience are also digitalized. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really want to already thank uh, all the attendants here. Um, yeah, we can uh, also welcome live questions. If you want to ask directly, you can also raise up your hand. Anybody? Or for Japanese audience, if you are worried about writing in English, you can also write in Japanese. I will translate for you. If you want. Okay, before the ah, there is a new questions. Okay, from Kang. Let's try to answer on live. Thank you for your lecture. I'm learning a lot about digital technology in the tourism. But there are two sides to everything. It is true that the application of technology in the field of tourism especially by shaping the behavior of tourists, will contribute to this sustainability. But on the other hand, due to the advancement of ICT development of social media in recent years, tourists are trying to draw eyeballs on social media. That's a very important point. Take photos and share them first, but you don't actually go to eat camera, eat first, so this kind of food sharing behavior, which has also caused a lot of food waste. What do you think about this kind of food waste problem brought about by the digital technology in tourist uh, food consumption and how to avoid this kind of problem? And thank you very much. Mm, that's a great question, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's a great question. And um, food tourism or food has become so central to tourism. Uh, it, it, it has been always, but with the event of social media, showing what you're doing or showing what you're eating has become uh, often more important than the act of eating or enjoying yourself, right? So um, in many instances, the attention goes away from um, the value that is embedded in tourism and travel as a thing in itself to showing um, uh, what you're doing and how that has meaning within a different uh, social context. Uh, for example, people at home or your audience online on social media channels. Yeah, I think aside from food, it applies to many other things. Uh, showing that you have been there uh, tends to becoming an in, uh, increasingly important feature of travel in itself, uh, which is um, uh, advertised through social media. So in that sense, social media becomes a vehicle uh, for social matters. Uh, it's it's not social media itself, but there is um, um, a situation, uh, let's say, uh, and uh, um, it's not a problem, but it's it's a fact. Um, 
that people um, feel in need of showing their individual achievements, right? And social media becomes a tool through which uh, we can show uh, that people exist and that they've achieved certain things. Um, so um, I think I think it's always important to look at the source of things. So what is it that makes us in feeling in need of showing this to other people? Um, and um, and I, I guess that the answer, uh, I don't have an answer for that, but I can I can see that this focus on the self uh, is also the result of, of broader patterns in society, it also has to do with uh, neoliberalism, the focus on the individual, uh, individual success and how you show that and how you make money out of that uh, through social media is, is one way, of course. Um, so yeah, uh, and that can be to, yeah, to food waste, as I see in this question. <laughs> um, I'm sure, sure in some cases it does. Yeah, right. I think some part of the experience at the destination is we are looking for Wi-Fi whenever we visit a, a country. Uh, Wi-Fi is definitely the first thing you want to connect in the airport, and also posting on social media is like your your biological needs, part of the travel experiences, right? For some people, right. not for all right. the people, but for majority of people, it's already part of them. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Which uh, I don't think is necessarily negative. Um, yeah. um, some people find real enjoyment out of this affirmation, right, about showing... Right where they are um but if it leads to food waste it's uh it's something mm -hmm. to think about i would say yeah All right uh before the next question coming i think uh i'm doing rural tourism study so i'm really see not all the destination are already uh, equipped with ict technology there so a lot of regions still quite of in between some are good some are not that good. So my question is, unlike the urban area, so for the rural area, apply digital in travel may, may be somehow challenging. So can you see the differences between the urban and rural community yeah. for this topic? Yeah. I didn't uh, speak about that during this presentation, but uh, the digital divide that I spoke about earlier, uh, that not only applies to countries, uh, mm -hmm. it applies to um, regions and it applies to urban and rural environments. Uh, so in general, less populated areas tend to be underserved when it comes to internet connection, when mm -hmm. it comes to infrastructure in general that enables uh, a digital uh, or digitized tourism experience. Um, and this is across the globe. So this is uh, it, surely there are even further divisions across uh, what we call majority or minority worlds. Um, but um, yes, the in general, globally, there are divisions between rural and urban communities in terms of how they are connected. Um, I would say in the current age of digital overload, this might also turn into an opportunity for people who wish to have a digital detox, as I mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to glorify the digital divide. Huh? There, is, there are real issues prevalent because people are underserved. They don't participate in the, um, let's say, economic benefits that, that uh, for example, highly connected uh, destinations do have. But... Um, there is also a niche in tourism that really looks for destinations where the pressures and anxieties that are produced by digital technologies are absent. Uh, and in that sense, some uh, rural communities, but also um, uh, un un under or unpopulated areas really advertise themselves as the place where people can actually disconnect. Um, so, yeah. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Yu Ping. She is one of the PhD students here, and she is also a filmmaker. And thank you for the wonderful lecture. Social media content has always attracted people to travel somewhere. And however, in reality, this has caused some problems. For example, there are places that's 
were not tourist attraction before, and suddenly influx of tourists could damage a local community, probably means the community impact here. How do you think this can be avoided? Mm, that's quite a challenging question. <laughs> that's a very that's another very good question. Um, mm. oftentimes certain places or communities do not elect themselves to become a mass tourist destination or to be even visited by tourists. And this is indeed something that certain digital technologies or apps or platforms uh, allow to happen. Um, it is embedded in the kind of business model of many of these apps that people use them and create hypes or certain um, you know, uh, popular events uh, that is part of certain apps and business models. So uh, what I would say, is there a solution to this? Well, first of all, I think we need to hold these companies to account for creating those kind of infrastructures that lead to people and places and communities to suddenly become a part of something they don't want. Um, it is also, in that sense, I think we should shift the focus from uh, individuals from tourists to the companies that create these kind of apps um, and uh, also it is obviously a, a matter of a change in public understanding of what is sustainable tourism do we really want to be part of a hype and uh, you know go to places where people actually don't want us so this are this is also the responsibility i think of the tourism industry is to refrain from pro promoting places and people that actually did never give their consent to be part of that. Uh, so yeah, there's different responsibilities uh, in different places. Um, yeah, but an easy solution, unfortunately, there is none. <laughs> okay, uh, I have another question. So Apple recently launched the Vision Pro. We know before we always have this discussion <laughs> Uh, between virtual and reality nowadays is seems like the future we're getting kind of a more mixed so how do we redefine digital and reality in future when we travel thanks for that question um mm -hmm. yes virtual reality has a very long history and uh, it's interesting that virtual reality continues to be uh, on the forefront of many, um, again, Northern American uh, <laughs> companies, uh, because clearly it hasn't really picked up as much as they wanted to. So it keeps on being promoted. But if you look at the history of kind of 3D Im imaginaries, it is very long. Um, in terms of tourism, my understanding of the literature is as follows. I've just started to move into this kind of realm of research in virtual reality is that um, destinations can never really provide, or sorry, virtual representations of destinations can never really provide um, the kind of social dynamics that are taking mm. place in place. Mm. Uh, and they won't be because um, there is a here and now of a certain destination, something is happening somewhere for example, in your room or in uh, Hokkaido University or Tokyo or wherever in Japan, uh, that will never be part of the real experience. Mm. Um, but virtual reality can definitely serve um, as a kind of stimulant to go to places or um, right. it can be mm. an alternative for people who cannot afford to go there or for other reasons. Um, one of the reasons people have uh, imagined virtual reality as a future is because of the glo global warming. Um, people uh, shouldn't travel that much or that long mm. uh, and virtual reality can give people an experience avoiding those kind of sustainability impacts that they might have by taking an airplane to go there. Mm. Um, yes, but there are severe limitations to virtual reality uh, and um, it will never quite replace what we experience in, in real life. Uh, that that is that is for sure. But it can be uh, an alternative way of experiencing mm. um, a site. Yeah. Yeah, I'm asking this question because it's also highly spatial related, and is related to 
the reality of geography, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It is a, per definition a spatial technology, virtual reality. Mm. Um, yeah, one of the main aims is, is to create virtual representations of spaces. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. Okay. Thank you. I think if there is no more question, I think we had a 30 minutes QA as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much everybody i think we can close tonight's session and uh yeah we will upload this video and thank you marcia for sharing this topic and uh, we are very looking forward to follow up with you in future and your thanks future so research as well okay thanks everybody for the invitation. thanks for the question uh, yes have a great day and have a great evening uh thank we will you see so you much. in the next episode okay see you Thank you.